Hello and welcome to Out of the Dark Room on Adorama TV. I'm Ruth Mejber and today I'm chatting again to photojournalist Charles McQuillan. Thanks for sticking with us. Now, if you could begin to introduce me to all of these fabulous lenses that I have been eyeing The toys, up. Yes. the toys. All, you can't call them toys, though. It's you your profession, it's your profession. No. Let's um, not do that. We start at the bottom and then work our way up to the top. I just dig in. Right, okay. <laughs> so the widest lens, um, I haven't brought everything with me today. You haven't brought everything with you? Brought brought everything with you. Are you today. serious? This I is did. madness, okay. Um, so the 14 to 24, Yes. Um, that's the, that's the kind of, that's the leveler in the, in the press scrum. So when that lens comes out, all the Canon users are going to have to, obviously, they start getting nervous. This is super wide, right? It's super wide. Yeah. And it's a fantastic lens because it actually doesn't distort as much as it, you, you re would really think it should do at 14. At 14. It doesn't. It's a, it's a masterpiece of a lens. It's a fantastic piece of glass. Really, really amazing. So you use this mainly when it's a news story or something? If it's a news story and it's really tight and there's a bit of a scrum, you've got loads of TV crews and other photographers. So loads of people around Yeah, you. all the people and a lot of pushing and elbows and that kind of thing can get a bit... And get you're a bit like, messy. okay, okay, that's, that's cool. So you don't need like you're kind of probably on top of the person you're shooting. Yeah, and everyone else kind of yeah. coming it, in. It, these things always seem to happen in tight spaces. There's never, you know, there's never any sort of decorum. Everybody just kind of goes in. Um, if you know, if, this if is people your go behave, guy. yeah, this is this is the kind of that's the get out okay. of jail card. Now there's a couple that I do recognize and that I have as well. Twenty four to seventy is uh, another fantastic lens. Yeah, um, I think actually they talk about I think. They talk about the, the 1424 and the 70 and the 7200 as the trinity of Nikon lenses. It's like the holy trinity that's of lenses. That's it. I mean, I think that's pretty much across all genres of photography yeah. what we'd all use, right? I yeah, think. I mean, that probably is the most used lens, um, certainly for feature stuff. It's such a good lens. It's 2.8. Um, would love to shoot primes and nothing but primes, but you just don't have that luxury whenever you're, you're no. shooting. This gives you a bit of And it's so much versatil versatility yeah. with that lens. It's, yeah, no, it's a great it's lens. good. I know, it's stuck on my camera forever yeah. and ever and ever. That's it. Like, um, right, okay. And this, which I'm personally humming and hawing about, about buying at the moment. And um, the 2414. 2414. Have your review, please. So yeah. then I'll make my mind up whether I'm going to buy it or not. So the 14, obviously, your prime, it's, it's a special lens for... We wouldn't say special occasions, but it's whenever you want to try and do something that's just a, you know, lift the picture a wee bit, or you have the time to do it, mm. and it's not a mad scrum. So the thing about the 1.4 lens is that it's not going to be sharp at 1.4 all the time. It just isn't, you just, you just have to live with that, that your, some of your shots, there isn't going to even seem to be any point of focus on it, it's just going to be soft. Really? But, but yeah, but whenever, you know, the other half of the time, um, Whenever it's it's pin, it's just it's stunning. So it's you it, it's you're going to get that creamy sort of bokeh texture on the outside, you know, off your focus point. Again, I would use that more for kind of feature work. If it was a hard news story and everything needs to be sharp in case something happens, that wouldn't be the lens I would have on the camera. I would stick with the twenty-four to seventy. Good old twenty-four to seventy. Okay, it's bad boy. Another familiar lens. Yes, the seventy to two hundred. Yeah. Is this another go-to lens for you? This is another, yeah. Um, again, a perfect lens for, I would use that as a, on a second camera if I was doing a sports event. Things get a wee bit closer. Or if it's goal mouth action, you're going to drop down to 70 to 200. Primarily, I shoot on the D5. Um, my second body is the D4S, and that's for day-to-day -day new stuff. Then if I'm shooting features, I shoot on the D810. Um, and why is that then? Because it's, the image quality is better. Um, but it's a camera that needs to be treated slower yeah. and treated with more care and it doesn't seem to have you can kind of make mistakes with these two cameras and you can kind of get away with it whereas i think with d810 it punishes you yeah. and as much as you know, your shutter speed and a wee bit you know a wee bit of camera shake it's going to be there so it's a it's a it's a more disciplined camera to use Absolutely, I don't think you, I think the D4S is quite a forgiving camera. Yeah. I mean, I can go into like a club and shoot really dark, yeah. you know, and slightly mess things up and just rescue it later yeah. and it's fine. So that's probably why I'm suited well to it. And you were saying the D5 is incredible, it's even better than the D4S. I think, yeah, it's definitely, it's definitely faster and the autofocus is more consistent. Yeah. Um, so that's a big, okay, maybe. It's a big plus. And, you know, that extra, however many frames yeah. a second, which is always debatable, 
Um, <laughs> it's, it, it does make a difference. It, it can mean, you know, I've noticed from shooting digital Nikons, you know, even as simple as, you know, you're shooting a goal mouth and before, you know, the, the ball was either on the foot and then the ball was either gone or at the very edge of the frame, oh, of you're so. actually getting maybe extra frames with the ball Within in it that, and yeah. that's, that's, that's big. That's what you rely on though. Yes. I mean, these are all serious professional cameras. I mean, people watching this though, I started on a Nikon D70 and they were yeah. proper toy cameras now. And I shot my first billboard campaign on that. So you can actually do loads with the camera you have regardless. You don't need to spend so to much totally, money on it. Totally. I think whenever you're buying the pro end cameras, you're really buying durability. And that's, exactly. that's it's not, I mean, even like, Going back to film days, you had your top of the range camera would have been the F3. Mm. Um, so that was the be all and end all. And that was that way for a very, very long time. Whereas nowadays, the top end camera is the D810 when it comes to quality, um, yeah. the biggest file size, but it's not the most expensive camera. So it doesn't necessarily hold that the most expensive is the best. And definitely it, not the best for you, whatever no, you're doing. No, yeah, no, that's it's, perfect. The, the game has changed certainly yeah. in that way, Ruth. Absolutely. So this brings us on nicely to this giant elephant in the room, this lens that's been staring us down this whole time. The 600. The 600. It's amazing. It's a beast of a lens. And this is what you shot that fantastic surfer shoot on, right? Yeah, the, the photograph of, the, of Alistair Balmeni at the end of the pier. Yeah, so there's a bit of a story with that photograph in as much as generally the 600 is not a lens you would hand, hand hold at any time. Uh, it's, no. it's heavy. You want to try lifting it? I, just, <laughs> I don't know. It's mental. I think this is, this is, it's taller than my knee. Okay, right. So you're, you're, you hand hold this. So, well, not, okay, not, as, a rule, not as a rule, <laughs> not as a rule, not as a rule. If I drop this, I'm really, really sorry. Okay, oh my God. So that day, um, a surfer, a surfer, <laughs> Al that day was rolling from right to left down the line. So okay. I'm, I'm, down the beach, um, and it was obviously it was a really stormy day. Um, yeah. In that location, there is a bar mouth, which is effectively two piers that run out parallel to each other, with the river running out. I would use that like almost like a like a ski lift. So you get in the river, and the river will carry you out, out the back of the waves, and yeah. you know you can get back on the waves again, rather than having to you know really fight to get out through through the wash. So I had already caught a couple of waves, and then he decided instead of getting into the water in the river and getting the ski lift out, he started to walk up the pier. I realised, right, there's a picture in this, but I'm way, way out of position, maybe two, three hundred yards out of position. So I dropped the monopod because it was going to be really awkward to run with and just ran with the D at 10 and the 600 to get into position along the dune. Ran with Ran this. with the lens. Yeah. So it was, it, was a good, um, it was a good test for... Of strength. Of strength and of my heart. After the operation, yeah, obviously. After that, you poor <laughs> so, thing. What so, are you doing to yourself? So um, I just got into position and no more and heaving and breathing and trying to steady myself and handhold the 600 and get the frame sharp. What would you have been set at to get that Well, it wasn't sharp? that bright that day. So and I, didn't, I hadn't the ISO pushed really high because the D810 won't go anywhere near as high as the D5, D5. or D4S. So I think probably my shutter speed would have been down to... I think probably about 500th of a second, which is, you know, your borderline there, really. With this, you're getting yeah. a lot of shake with yeah. that. I yeah. suppose it's magnified to... But there's a way, I mean, like, personally, for me, if I, whenever sometimes you, you have to handhold and there's nothing else you can do, I kind of dig my elbow into... Anchor and, yourself. And, yeah, and yeah. just try and steady myself up. And I, at that point, I dropped down on, onto my knees, so I was trying to really just sort of kind of level the camera yeah, as much as possible. pin sharp. Yeah. Amazing shot. Yeah. And also what it did was, because it was shot in the 600 and I didn't have time to think, oh, I shouldn't, we should be shooting on this, shouldn't that. The 600 really compressed the image, yeah. which made it even punchier, which made Al look, you know, you know fantastic yeah. against that wave. Um, and as well, I just noticed we didn't talk about your flashes. You've got two SB900s then. So. I use the 900s, I just haven't upgraded with... Um, but they're brilliant. But they're brilliant, When yeah. they don't overheat, they're brilliant, brilliant yeah. flashes. I loved those as well. I loved working with them. So do you do a lot of off-camera? Yeah, I would use a lot of 
I, I, if it was shooting feature stuff, generally speaking, I would. It's either it's again, it's either one way or the other. It's either no lights or off shoe. I very rarely, very rarely, would shoot anything on shoe. Yeah. I'd much rather have it off to the side. It just it just lifts. You know. So much nicer, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, yeah, definitely. And then when you were doing your your heart surgery photographs, tell me about what was set up and where. Um, that would have probably been D3s, come to think of it. Um, so it was a case of, I used pocket wizards as, because I use the old ones, which are the transceivers, because they're the most consistent, they're over the greater, greatest distance. I've tried some of the digital, a lot of, yeah. I've seen a lot of people using some of the, the Japanese imports and stuff, yeah. and they are really good, but as regards consistency and distance, the pocket wizards just, just for me, can't be beat. So you've got so much experience across so many different genres of photography and I know all of our audience watching this also have a massive interest in photography. Could you impart some of your wisdom to us and maybe give us a tip um, just so that we can better our own shooting styles or even just progress our career a little bit? Um, first thing I would say Ruth is that I make mistakes all the time. Like there's, yeah, there's many, there's plenty of, nearly every day I come away and say, well, I should have done this different or I wish I'd done like, and you become obsessed sometimes, not by the pictures you have taken, but by the pictures that you've missed. Mm -hmm. So the first thing I would say is take plenty of pictures, get out, walk, you know, when you're out walking, out seeing stuff, just take pictures. You have to get out there. And probably the other thing, if you're a beginner, this is not a, a tip for anybody that's, you know, obviously is interested in photography or has been taking pictures for a while, is that for, for beginners, I find a lot of beginners are shooting on automatic all the time. So I say to them, look, don't shoot on automatic, shoot on manual. You're maybe not going to, you know, get it straight away, but eventually yeah. you're going to quickly pick, pick up, you know, your depth of field and your shutter speeds rather than let the camera figure it out for you. Yeah. You, you just, you're more immersed in it and you have more control. And tell us then, um, you've got so much digital equipment here. Have you ever, ever, ever um, any notions of going back to film? Um, there is a couple of film cameras in the house that are really just ornaments now. There's an F3 sits, which is just fantastic to look at and hold. It has the motor drive, it's just, no, I think it's the best camera ever made to actually hold. I don't know if you've, it's a yeah, no, big it, motor drive, it's just, it's a, it's a chunk of metal, yeah. it's just lovely. And there is a, 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 an old Mamiya, I think it's a C330F or something that's sitting in the house, but I I did have an X-Pan, a Hasselblad X-Pan, which I got rid of a while back, but I think I'm going to purchase it again to do a project, just in kind of CinemaScope kind of wide, mm. with a couple of ideas. Um, so I'm going to go back to that and then just, I'll, I'll, I'll dev the films myself and then have them digitally scanned. Um, and would that be more of like a personal project or is it like a commission you have in mind? Um, I would say it'd be a mixture of both, I think. I have an idea for it, so but then I want somebody obviously to pay to for pay it. To pay for it, yeah. <laughs> so so I can claw back some of the some of the. Oh, listen, I know it all too well. That's fantastic. Yeah, it's been an absolute insight into your world, and I've I've loved playing with all the gear, and I loved hearing your stories, and I can't thank you enough for coming and joining me today. Thank you, Ruth. Well, that's all we have time for in this episode. I really hope you enjoyed the show. If you'd like to brush up on your own photography skills, check out the Adorama Learning Centre, and if you want to watch more videos, then subscribe to our show. Thanks, and I'll see you again soon.